This is Smart Poker Study, episode 170, answering your questions about VPIP and PFR, thoughtful decisions, and abundant poker content. I hope you made some smarter goals for 2018 like I discussed in last week's episode number 169. And don't forget to work on some good habits to help you accomplish those goals. It's poker study time, y'all, and you are the reason for the season. This show only exists because you listen and you tell your friends. So thank you very much, and Merry Christmas, of course. So before you all yell at me for not seeing The Last Jedi yet, I have a really good reason, I promise you. The kids are out of school next week for Christmas break, so we're waiting for that. Thankfully, I have successfully avoided every movie trailer for it so far, so I have no idea what to expect. Uh, Other than there's going to be a Jedi in it, and maybe he's the last one. And speaking of one, I want to thank the one, the only, Corey Harwig for being my newest supporter on Patreon. Thanks for joining the Patreon party this season, Corey. My supporters on Patreon are the very best, and I wish you all a super Merry Christmas. I love creating this show for y'all, and the time that I spend creating it is supported by everyone on Patreon. Your support shows me that you enjoy the show, and you want it to never stop, never stopping. To start your own support of the show, go to Patreon, that's P A T. R-E-O-N dot com slash smart poker study. There are different levels of support with different rewards attached. And just this past week, I sent out the rewards for December. The podcast was a special heads up poker challenge with a couple of prizes up for grabs. And it's only open to Patreon subscribers. And the training video showed you how to use Poker Tracker 4 to look at the population tendencies of your opponents. So once you begin your support on Patreon, you'll get the current month's reward as well as access to the archive of patron-only content. For just a few dollars a month, less than one buy-in for many of you, you'll support the show and receive some valuable content in return. So visit patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy to start your support. Okay, I think it's that time. It's Q&A time. We have three of them today from Charles, Lou, and Nick. So please visit the show notes page for everything I discussed today. www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod 170. Okay, Gambate! This is damn exciting stuff. Today's first question today is about the relationship between VPIP and PFR. And it's from our buddy Charles. He's the one that asked about VPIP and PFR separately in the prior two Q&As. So he and I went back and forth via email and I told him that on today's episode, I'll talk about the relationship between the two. So... Here goes. VPIP and PFR together, they're a magical combination of stats that tells us the type of player that we're up against. So how do they do this, you might be asking. It's the relationship between the two, baby. We're going to look at the relationship between these two numbers uh, in regards to the various player types you're going to be up against. The first player type I'm going to discuss is the loose passive player. Uh, We often call these fish, whales, or stations, and these are our targets at the tables. These are the players that we're going to make the most money from. Let's look at two example loose passive players. The first one is a 50 slash 10 player. So this player plays 50% of hands pre-flop and they only raise 10% of hands. So when they play a hand pre-flop, they play it aggressively only 20% of the time. The other 80%, they're checking, they're calling, they're limping. They're just playing it passively, basically. The second player example, you might see these quite often, it's a 30 slash 5 player. So they play only 30% of hands, and they raise only 5%. So 5 out of 30 means that they're aggressive pre-flop only 17% of the time. Now, these players, these loose passive fish uh, with these kinds of stats, I often color code them green. And green obviously means go, so I want to enter as many pots as possible with these green colored opponents. The next opponent I want to talk about is our tight aggressive, our tag players. And that's what we we normally call them, tags. Now, two example player stats for these. The first is a 20 slash 15 player. This player plays 20% of hands and they raise 15%. So when they enter a pot, they enter it aggressively 15 out of 20 times or 75%. They know the importance of aggression and they use it to steal pots and they have post-flop initiative with all of this aggression. Another common tag stat that you'll see is like a 15-12. They're still tight aggressive, just a little bit tighter than that 20-15 player. 
because they're a little bit tighter, they miss out on lots of money-making opportunities, but they still love raising. These players raise 12 out of every 15 times, so that's 80% aggression pre-flop. They don't call too often at all. If they are calling, they're calling with uh, decent pairs, suited connectors, and they're calling in position with Broadway hands as well. I color code these players yellow, or I'll color code them blue if they're winning tight aggressive players. And yellow basically means caution. You know, when they're in a pot, it's often for a good reason, so I have to be slightly wary before I enter after them. Kind of related to those tag players, let's talk about the ultra tight and aggressive players. We often call these nits. Uh, two example stats for these players. The first is a 10 slash 8. So these players only play 10% of hands preflop. And when they do, they're coming in for a raise 80% of the time. Their tiny range, it's really value heavy. And it gives them a better shot at hitting the flop hard with top pairs and over pairs. And any kind of draws they have are often nut straight or nut flush or second nut flush kind of draws. The other example of a nit is a 10 slash 2 player. So this player is ultra tight, but a bit passive. They only play 10% of hands still, but they come in for a raise with only the strongest hands, like pocket jacks are better and ace king. When I come across a nit player, I often color code them red. They're raising, so they've got a strong hand. Hopefully, I've got position and a good hand that can crack big pocket pairs and ace king. Now on the completely opposite spectrum from the 10 slash 2 player, let's talk next about lags, loose aggressive players. So an example stat for this player is a 35 slash 25. So this one plays a big 35% range preflop and comes in for raises with 25% of hands. This is pretty darn aggressive. We'll take some time right now. Whip out Flopzilla or some kind of an equity calculator and try to build a 35% range and a 25% range. Try to build those without suited gappers or offsuit hands and you just really can't do it. Give it a shot, but let's see how strong of a range you can actually build. These players play a ton of hands aggressively, which makes it pretty tough to, 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 to make a profit with this style of play. It is doable. It just takes a ton of study and practice and really understanding your opponents and knowing who you can push around with that aggressive play. Another loose aggressive player, another lag that you're going to see, is like the 30 slash 22 player. These players are still very aggressive. Uh, they have a gap of 8% between the two, you know, 30 slash 22, there's an 8% gap there. So not only are they aggressive, but they do plenty of calling as well, either from late position or from the blinds. I color code these lags in orange color, or I'll color code them blue if they're a winning loose aggressive player. So when I see the orange color on my left, I know that I'm going to be put to the test. Orange or blue, of course. And now let's go even further. Let's talk about the ultra lags. These are the guys that I, that I often call donks or maniacs. So an example stat of one of these is like 50 slash 35. Wow, can you imagine playing 50% of hands and playing 35% of hands aggressively with, with like two bets, isolation raises, three bets, and squeezes pre-flop? This really is a disastrous style of play. They can quickly build stacks when the cards are falling their way, but they can lose stacks even quicker. Another ultra lag or donk or maniac that you'll encounter is the 50 slash 25 player. So we think of donks and maniacs as using too much aggression, which is totally true. But this donk, this 50 slash 25 player, has a gap of 25 between VPIP and PFR. This means that they're passively playing 25% of hands pre-flop. That is a ton of limping and calling just to see the flop. If you build out a 25% range using Flopzilla or Poker Stove or something, you'll see it contains a ton of weak crap that can really only win money with super bluffy aggression or just hitting miracle flops. I mean, how often can you really win a big pot with Jack-7 suited? Are they, you know, how likely are they to make that profitable? That's why this donk style is just so difficult to play and difficult to make profitable. And I definitely color these players with an orange using Poker Tracker 4. And they're just overly aggressive with way too many hands. So when I'm playing against them, I strive for in-position play, and I look for good opportunities to pick up their chip spew, which they're eventually going to do. So thank you for this VPIP and PFR question, uh, uh, Charles. I do appreciate it. Question number two, 
is about the abundance of poker content out there. And it comes from Lou. And um, many of you might not know Lou, but I imagine eventually someday all of you will. He is Poker Dad on YouTube. He's putting out a ton of micro stakes content, not only his play online, but also going through his um, his bankroll challenge right now, um, hand, re reviewing hands on his site. And he's just an all around great guy. I really like his videos. I recommend that you check him out. Poker Dad on YouTube. And in the show notes, you can find a link. But Lou sent me an email, and this is what he says. With all of the amazing poker content out there, especially on YouTube, how do you prioritize what to watch, and how do you decide what is useful content and what is garbage? Thanks from Lou. Alrighty, I do appreciate that question, Lou. So there are three things that I recommend to help prioritize your content studies, as well as to help you not waste time with the garbage out there. The first thing is subscribe to your favorite content creators. So maybe your favorite is Split Suit, or it's Nathan Williams, Black Rain 79, or it's Jonathan Little, or uh, uh, Alex Fitzgerald, Assassinato. Subscribe to their channel and turn on notifications. Also, of course, go to their uh, go to their website, so sign up for their newsletter, so you can see every newsletter comes that comes out, and. Once you subscribe to their stuff, don't watch every video or read every article. You want to search through their channel for keywords that relate to the theme of your week's study. And this, of course, relates to the second recommendations I have. And that's basically to create a weekly study plan. I've talked about it in both of my books already. But if you're working on your three betting this week, you want to search through your favorite content creator's website and YouTube channel for relevant videos and articles. Don't bother watching a sea betting video or a sweat session video if your focus is on three bets this week. And my third recommendation is to take notes and cut bait if necessary. So you want to take notes as you watch or you read a piece of content and choose action steps to put into practice what you're learning. If the content seems like it's of little or no use at all, don't force yourself to finish the video or read out the entire article. Cut bait quickly and move on to another piece of content. If it doesn't capture your imagination and suck you in, it just won't be as impactful to you. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from and plenty of poker stuff. You can get How to Study Poker Volumes 1 and 2. You can get books from Jonathan Little. You can get books from Dr. Trisha Cardner. They're all out there on Audible. And if you're looking for something awesome to listen to outside of poker, I highly recommend Bruce Campbell's book. It's called If Chins Could Kill. He narrated himself, and, you know, of course he does. He's got a great speaking voice. He's a great storyteller, and he does a terrific job. It is super fun listening to his stories about uh, growing up and making Super 8 videos as a kid, creating the Evil Dead series with Sam Raimi, and his adventures on Briscoe County Jr. and a lot of different television shows and various B-movies he's been in. So I highly recommend that one. You can get it through your Audible trial. Once again, audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy. And two shout outs today. The first shout out is to Flavio Oliveira. He purchased the Smart HUD. Thank you very much, Flavio. You sent me tons of questions about it. I've answered those questions. I hope you're using it to murdelate, murdelate, murdelize your opponents. And the second shout out goes to Ralph. M. What he did was he left a killer five-star review for How to Study Poker Volume 2. And this is what he said. I've been playing poker for many years, and I always felt like I was way behind people in terms of skill. But I didn't know where to start. I watched lots of videos with no rhyme or reason or method. I just looked at what sounded interesting. I started several books that I never finished. I played and won just often enough to keep me interested in the game. Earlier this year, I discovered Sky's podcast, and I was instantly hooked. As soon as this book was released, I grabbed a copy. Diving into it, I soon realized that I not only didn't know what to study, but I had no idea how to study poker. It has been the biggest pivotal point in my poker journey so far. I now have a method and structure in place that has helped me maximize my study hours to really improve my game and my results. Thanks, Sky, for this amazing book. Well, thank you very much for that review, Ralph. I do appreciate it. And actually, Ralph, I met Ralph... Uh, this past year at the Colossus, he and I played in it together at, um, uh, you know, in Las Vegas at the Colossus, of course. Uh, we met, you know, uh, mid-session. Uh, I was on a break. He was on a break and everything. Really good guy. And um, thank you very much for that review, Ralph. I do appreciate it. 
Alrighty, back to class, poker people. Today's question number three comes to us from Nick Rasuti, and it's about making thoughtful decisions. This is what he said in an email to me. I don't tilt emotionally, but I just play badly sometimes. Autopilot, button clicking, and when I do, I can't easily turn it around and start playing well. This is my bankroll killer. Well, thank you so much for that email, Nick. And random button clicking and autopiloting, it can definitely hurt the bankroll. You say it's not tilt that affects you, but maybe there's a little there that you don't realize is there. I know that sometimes if I'm angry, I will spiked call or re-raise or bluff bet just to try and get an opponent off a hand or just hoping my hand is good enough without really thinking through my decisions. It seems like button clicking when I'm doing this, but it's because some form of anger or rising emotions is blocking me from my logic centers. It's possible you suffer from the same thing, so at least consider it. In order to ditch that straight up button clicking or autopiloting or robotic play, the first thing I'd recommend is playing a minimum number of tables. Being on say like eight tables, it promotes robotic play. Cut it down to four or less to give you more time to think through your decisions. Also, I recommend that you use a tick sheet to record why you're making each play. Getting away from autopilot is going to require that you pay attention to the action and have a reason for every button click you make. I talked about tick sheets in my book, but it's a piece of paper where you make a tick every time you make a specific action. You know the little four lines, tick, 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 and then a slash across for number five? You can see a tick sheet in today's show notes, or an example tick sheet in today's show notes. Um... What I'd recommend for you, Nick, is create a tick sheet with these words on it. Bluff, value, unsure, and fold. So when you're calling, betting, or raising, know the reason why you're doing it and make a tick under the appropriate word. If you're calling, betting, or raising for value, then mark it as such. Betting or raising as a bluff, mark it as a bluff. If you're checking or calling because you're unsure of what the proper play is, make a tick under unsure. If you're folding because you know you're beat and you think a bluff won't work, then make a tick under fold. Also, make sure to turn off all distractions. No TV, no phone, no apps, no video games while you play a little bit of poker. None of that crap. Descriptions. (laughs) I guess that's a cool word. Descriptions pull you away from what you're doing, and that's not conducive to great poker. Challenge. Here's my challenge to you for this episode. Use a tick sheet to record the reason for every action you make over your next two sessions. Ultimately, you'd want to see more ticks under value than bluff and no ticks at all under unsure. Ticks under fold is fine, as long as you first consider making a potential bluff. Remember, you can't win a hand when you fold. Now it's your turn to take action and do something positive for your poker game. Oh, that's it now. Get out there and be somebody. This episode is not complete until you head to the show notes page at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod170. You'll see links and screenshots of everything I discussed today. And you'll find ways in which you can support the podcast and keep me keeping on. Thank you so much for listening today. Have you enabled my Alexa flash briefing skill yet? It allows you to play the latest podcast episode every morning as you brush your teeth or make your breakfast. Just search for Smart Poker Study in the Amazon Alexa store. After you test it out, please leave a five-star review. And if you could type the words Smart Poker Study, you can find me on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and now on Share My Pair. And if you've got any questions, please send them on in, sky at smartpokerstudy.com. Alrighty, poker people, next week in episode 171, I will conclude the 10th minimum effective dose on poker mindset when I discuss various mental stuff like stress, performing optimally, a FOMO, and some other goodies. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so thank you very much for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring is what helps us grow. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet.